Right, so hello everyone, and welcome to this um, webinar series on rate splitting multiple access. This is our second seminar series. Um, so we had the first one last year, and now we starting this new second season of the webinar series on, on rate splitting multiple access. And today we have the privilege of hosting Professor Jin Hong Yuan from the University of New South Wales as our first uh, speaker. So Jin Hong had, um, is a professor of telecommunication in the School of en Electrical Engineering at the uh, University of New South Wales in Sydney in Australia. He received his bachelor and PhD degree from Beijing Institute of Technology. And he is a very well-known figure in the community. He has written uh, several books and book chapters and, and numerous um, uh, well-known journal papers. Um, and he received uh, several best paper awards. He's been uh, very active as uh, editor in various um, transactions, IEEE transactions, and is um, an IEEE fellow, very active in the area of information theory, communication theory, and, and wireless communications. So before I give the floor to Jin Hong, let's remind a few rules for this uh, webinar. So the talk will last about 50 minutes and the audience will be muted. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. And at the end of the talk, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So feel free to raise your hands uh, and we're gonna unmute you. Uh, otherwise, we can also ask questions from, um, from the chat. And with this, I leave the floor to you, Jin Hong. So I will stop sharing. Okay. And uh, yes, I just uh, try to share the screen. Thank you, Bruno, for your kind introduction. And the first, let me share the screen. Can you see now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. And Ouch. Sorry, it's been muted. Can you hear now? Yes, yes. Let me see. Okay, first, I would like to uh, take the chance to thank uh, Bruno for this kind of introduction and also thank uh, Lina and uh, Anapa and your group and the the RSMA special interest group uh, to organize this uh, uh, seminar series uh, and uh, your great initiative, uh, which is I uh, really enjoy a lot of your talks and uh, in your first series as well. It is uh, also my great honor to share some of our recent work uh, on rate splitting like a scheme. And uh, um, I think it's uh, slightly different from the previous work. So hopefully we can develop some uh, uh, common interest and, uh, and have some common discuss have some discussions and uh, also develop collaborations in the future. So the work is a uh, uh, rate splitting scheme with efficient interference management. Particularly, we are going to talk about the discrete signaling uh, and the treating interference as noise for Gaussian broadcasting channel and the uh, uh, interference channel. And uh, let me go to the page. Yes, yeah, so what I'm going to do is to try to cover, give us more background or introduction. Later on, talk about a, a lattice partition framework, or I call it a uh, rate splitting based scheme for downlink multiple access channel without a successful interference cancellation. Uh, later on, I'm going to apply the same tricks or the similar framework to other settings. Like if we know the statistic channel state information, how do we deal with this uh, uh, multiple access scheme? Or if we have a block fading channel, how do we deal with it? or later I'm going to Gaussian interference channel and the wizard summary. Now let's go to the int introduction part. Uh, interference, uh, when we're dealing with the wireless communications uh, and uh, you cannot get rid of interference because interference is a common phenomenon in our wireless system. 
doesn't matter it is in the interference that come from the same system. For example, you have adjacent cell interference or you have a same cell interference, or it is across a different system like your Wi-Fi system from a different vendors or Wi-Fi and uh, um, other, um, uh, other system using the same spectrum. They all give you interference. So wireless system design, interference management is a central problem here. So because that really limits our system performance because we have to share the resources. So that is a textbook slide uh, information. Now let's take a look at how to we deal with interference in a conventional system. So one way is to organize the communication links to avoid the interference. So by doing that one, we are doing like orthogonal transmission schemes um, or orthogonal like transmission schemes. Uh, the good thing about that kind of approach is we can have a simple transceiver design because the point-to-point -point communication system design principle or design schemes can be directly used to multi-point to point or multi-point to multi-point communication system. But the bad um, situation or the, the, the disadvantage is that you lost in degree of freedom, DOF. And the loss of the degree of freedom increases with the number of users. Means if you have a large number of users, the loss is more severe. Another approach in conventional system is to share the resources, but you need to treat the interference at the noise. So that determines how much you can transmit the signal, what you are going to do at your receiver side. That means in such approach, you do not explore the interference structure. So your performance, system performance is really limited by the interference. So beyond the orthogonal multiple access, and we have now this broadcasting channel, we use the superposition coding and the successive interference constellation, or we call the SIC, can achieve the capacity. Or we have, uh, or sometimes we call it a rate splitting multiple access, which is a core, th core topic of this theme or special interest group. What you do is you have a message splitting and you have a common and private message and you do superposition coding as well. But as a receiver side, what you do is you partially treating interference as noises. So you do TIN as well as you do partially SIC, partially successful interference cancellation. I would like to particularly thank Lena and Bruno for your and uh, the group for your excellent tutorial and uh, survey paper and the list here. So NOMA is a special case of RSMA and the uh, uh, outperformance, uh, the NOMA is outperformed by RSMA in certain situations. But they both achieve better spectrum efficiency and the user fairness than OMA. That's what we know. In current literature, in the research community, most of work assume Gaussian singling because that is easy to deal with when you do analysis. But it is difficult to implement in practical system, say how you, how you design Gaussian signal constellation, how you have a Gaussian um, uh, um, code book. So with that one, both the normal and the risk splitting multiple access requires Seek. But when you have a seek at your receiver side, you may have a few issues that need to be carefully considered. One is you do need a extra decoding latency and the complexity and the power consumption as well. Another thing with seek is uh, you, you probably have an error propagation. Due to you have a limited code length and your decoding is never perfect. That means you may make decoding errors. This decoding error could be propagated to other uh, de decoding or successive interference cancellation as well. You may compromise the user privacy and you also need to know the code book of other users and compared to single user system is a little bit more uh, a requirement. 
That is in the research community. In our industry community or in our current system, what we usually have is like a QAM, PSK, this discrete signaling. And at the receiver side, we always have the, the scheme is called the treating interference as noise or ping. And we use the practical channel coding modulation and together with ping, that is the current standard. So without a seek, this Gaussian signaling with ten do not work well in RSMA and the NORMA, that is to the best of our knowledge. But uh, the question is, but how about we design some discrete signaling with ten by using some principles from uh, um, rate splitting? And uh, hopefully this discrete signaling with ten can be performed well in practical system. So that is uh, a little bit of motivation. So in this work, we are going to study the fundamental behavior of a practical coding modulation and ten in a broadcasting channel and the interference channel. So we are going to introduce uh, an interesting but elegant uh, rate splitting like scheme using superposition coding as a transmitter side, but particularly we would like to pay attention, we are only using purely discrete signaling and doing uh, treating, uh, ten interference, uh, treating interference as noise as a receiver to do decoding. What does it maintain? Means the proposed scheme can use a single channel code for each user. And uh, at the receiver side, uh, we are going to use a single user decoding. We are not going to do successive interference and cancellation. We are not going to do joint decoding either. So we can use a simple decoder as what you do in your single user system. And we are going to show this practical coded modulation plus 10 can actually perform very close to the Gaussian signaling plus successive interference and cancellation. So that is really beneficial because you are using practical system closer to Gaussian uh, performance. You are using 10 single user decoding and closer to successful interference uh, 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 cancellation performance. I mean, here obviously you do have a gap there, but it is close. So as a result, we say this proposed scheme is applicable to existing systems. So that is a little bit of background for what we are going to uh, share with you tonight or this afternoon in your local time. Now let's take a look at uh, what is the lattice partition framework for downlink multiple access without a successful interference translation. Uh, we consider this a very simple broadcasting channel. So we have K users, U1 up to UK with their message. And uh, we are going to broadcast this message to K users. But before that, uh, we are going to do superposition coding. We doing some coding, we form the transmitter signal X is a, a combination of U1 up to UK's message. We assume this K users have a different signal to North ratios. Okay, so each uh, we uh, without a loss of generality, we assume user one is stronger than user, stronger than user two, and stronger than user three, and stronger than user k. Okay, and uh, assume each user's message is coded into a code book uh, with n dimensional space, and uh, that's why the average symbol energy epsilon, uh, the average symbol energy x is less than equal to n, you have your symbol energy normalization. And uh, we say the transmitter knows the perfect knowledge of the channel. Uh, consider a single antenna system or scalar broadcasting channel, which means we only require the transmitter know as a integer. Uh, which is calculated from a signal to noise ratio is shown here is a half log two as an RK for the case used. That is a, what you really need to know as a transmitter side, only integer number. Okay. 
The scheme we are going to propose is based on lattice partition. I'm not quite sure everyone familiar with lattice, so I would like to spend a few minutes to talk about this lattice partition. So what is a lattice? You can think about uh, it is just an n-dimensional lattice. It's a, a discrete set of points lambda in this n-dimensional space Rn. It can be mathematically said it is generated by n by n generated matrix G lambda, means your any n-dimensional vector B times this generated matrix form a lattice. So that is a, 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 a very simple representation. And the left-hand figure shows your two-dimensional lattice, the right-hand figure shows the three-dimensional lattice. So mathematically speaking, what is a lattice? You can think about that. Lattice has some group property, and uh, which is closed with the addition, under addition, it has a symmetric. You can see it is pretty symmetric, which implies this lattice point is geometrically uniform. Uh, means when you standing on any lattice, you look around on your uh, all dimensions, they all look very similar. That's why it is called a geometrically uniform. So each lattice has the same number of neighbors. Also the decision region are congruent, means if you do decoding and uh, the minimum distance decoding, are the, the decoding region are congruent. Okay, so that is a lattice, a very elegant representation. And with the lattice, I mean, I show you another lattice on this picture. So you can see you can do naive quantization. You can do different quantizations. So what I'm going to show you here is the nearest neighbor quantization. Means in this two dimensional space, any number can be quantized to the lattice point, which is closest to that. Uh, 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 point in the two-dimensional space. So with this quantization area, we call it the Voronoi region. That means for each lattice, the area which can be quantized to that lattice point, it is a Voronoi region. So which means all those points are closer to that particular lattice point rather than anyone else. We also have this fundamental Voronoi region means like in the middle part or in your origin zero and the region quantized to that origin is called a fundamental Voronoi region. As we know, you have a geometry uniform property. So any lattice point you shift, it is going to be another, it's going to be the same lattice. So that is called the um, uh, translation invariant or shift invariant. So that's a little bit, uh, oh, another uh, concept is called modular uh, lattice operation. For example, this red point can be modulated to be the second red point and within the fundamental Venori region. So that is uh, uh, basically what you do is just you do modular operation and you quantize it to the fundamental Venori region. Okay, so this is uh, the terminology we are going to use. Um, but most importantly, the terminology we are going to use is a lattice partition. What is a lattice partition? Assume we have a, a fine lattice, uh, lambda f, we also have a, a, a coarse lattice, a lambda C. The coarse lattice is a subset of a fine lattice. So for each fine lattice, your fine lattice would make a shift or make an addition to the coarse lattice, you form a core set in the coarse lattice. So any point, within the fundamental variable region is called a core set leader for that uh, particular core set. With this partition operation, we use this operation uh, lambda f over lambda c, we call it a partition. So the cardinality is determined by the volume of your coarse lattice over volume of your fine lattice. And uh, you can also have the rate of your lattice, means how much how many uh, bits you can transmit it per dimension 
is also relevant to your fine lattice size divided by cost lattice size log two, that's the number of bits for n dimension you normalize by n. So this is, looks like uh, abstract, but I'm going to use a very simple example to show you what is a lattice partition because we are going to use it uh, throughout the talk today. So this is a, a very simple integer lattice, it means uh, x plus jy. X is your integer, Y is your any integer. So that is our integer lattice. We usually say it's Z2. Assume this is our fine lattice. We can also have a coarse lattice. It's a 2Z2, means we have this even integer lattice. Rather, we only have this integer, we assume X plus JY and the X and the Y must be an even number, like zero plus zero or zero plus J2, zero plus J4 um, or two plus uh, two, uh, J2, two plus. Uh, so you see this is a two Z2, that is uh, our uh, even integer lattice. So it is more coarse, it is more sparse than our fine lattice uh, lambda F, okay? So with that one, you can do corset. You can do this uh, partition. Your fine lattice lambda F, modular uh, coarse lattice lambda C, you got this uh, lattice partition, just uh, similar to what we do in integer partition. And uh, with this uh, um, partition, you have four corsets. And each corset is, has its own corset leaders. Obviously, and the four cos that is zero, zero plus j, uh, j zero plus uh, 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 one plus, uh, sorry, zero j minus, uh, uh, let me, <laughs> let me, one plus j and uh, one. Okay, so that is our cos at leaders. You can think about that. So with this, uh, 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 corset, you have this corset leaders within the fundamental neural region of the coarse lattice. I use this uh, cross to represent uh, this corset leaders. And when we design code book based on the coarse, uh, this uh, pa uh, lattice partition, basically we, we map the code to this corset leaders. So each corset leader represents uh, a code word. For example, if we have four corset leaders, means we have uh, two bits. We have four code book, and each code book carries two bits. So that's very simple. So that is links so that is a partition with uh, coding or modulation. There's also figure for mirrors. We probably will be using it during the talk. Is the second moment or normalize the second moment. Uh, I think it is straightforward. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Now with that fun, uh, background, I'm going to introduce the proposed approach. How do we do lattice partition for downlink multiple access scheme without doing successive interference conservation? So the high level um, uh, approach can be represented by these four steps. First, we look into the determinist model of the broadcasting channel. Then we construct the capacity achieving schemes with the treating interference as noise. Okay, the determinist model has been introduced in David Shea and his groups, also in Jaffa and their groups as well. That's the first step. So we are going to use a determinist model. Second, we are going to translate the scheme from a deterministic model into a scheme can use a discrete modulation and the treating interference from the Gaussian broadcasting channel model. Third step is we are going to prove this transmission or translation or translated scheme actually can achieve the capacity of a deterministic channel model within a constant gap. Means the translated scheme has a gap to the capacity of a deterministic channel model. But that gap is a constant, is, a, is a bounded by a particular constant value. Fourthly, we are going to say, because the deterministic channel model 
and the Gaussian broadcasting channel model has a gap up bounded by constant. So we can say the proposed scheme also has a, a constant gap to the capacity uh, Gaussian broadcasting channel. So that is, we propose a scheme try to prove it is a capacity achieving with a constant gap. And uh, uh, I think there's also, uh, 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 this is a typical trick uh, and all the, the, the approach for people to do the capacity achieving scheme. First, you do DOF, degree of freedom analysis. Later on, you do generalized degree of freedom analysis. Later on, you do constant gap. And later on, you say it is a capacity achieving. Okay. Now let's revisit what has been proposed by David Shea and his group on this linear deterministic channel model. And how do we use, how we design schemes to achieve this capacity for a linear deterministic model? We consider a point-to-point -point AWGN channel. We transmit the signal is X, receive the signal is Y square root SNR plus X, uh, SNR X plus noise. So what we are going to do is we are going to represent your transmitted signal X using a binary expansion. So any X can be represented by using uh, let me see if I have all this uh, pen and highlighted. Any X can be represented by this value. Assume we use a binary real value signal. I mean, if you use a complex, you have a, another dimension. So we represent the S and R in this format. Your X is represented in this binary expansion. It's a very simple. In the meantime, we also represent your noise into a binary expansion. So basically what you do, you can see the deterministic process for your random noise. Okay, with that one, and uh, if we assume half log two as an R ceiling equal to N, that is your, I mean, this is not your capacity, but that is uh, close to the capacity at a high signal to noise ratio. So let's just say that is uh, the number of bits you try to achieve. So at the end of the day, you can decompose your transmitter signal. One part is from, uh, you decompose the most significant bits from a first bit to the nth bit or the less significant bits. You can see your less significant bits are noise at the same level, but your most significant bits are above the noise level. That means as a receiver side, we truncate the signal under the noise level. Your noise, anything below the noise, you can, your signal is missing. So at the end of the day, what you see at the receiver side is your transmitter signal, you only have N bits. So your N bits can be clearly seen above the noise level, so that's your capacity. So that is a linear deterministic channel model and we uh, use it, uh, I mean, developed by uh, David Shea and his group. That is a, a model we are going to use it. Now we are going to use that model for linear deterministic broadcasting channel, consider two users, okay? The input output relationship will be very simple. Say your transmitted superposition signal is X, your received signal at the user K is YK. It's actually, it's just your transmitted signal X represented into the binary expansion format as we showed it before. For user K, what you see is only truncated the transmitted signal those below the noise level will disappear. That means you are going to do a truncation for each user. And if we assume Q equal to the maximum capacity from the user one and the user two, so means those information below the capacity will be disappearing. So that S actually is this uh, low triangle um, or shift version of identical matrix is a Q by Q shift matrix. And uh, any signal 
operated by S means downshift by X to Q minus M positions. So that means bits below the noise level are truncated. So that is the input output relation for the Gaussian broadcasting channel in a deterministic way. Okay. So with that one, we are going to see how this determinant approach can, uh, um, uh, how this determinant model can approach the Gaussian broadcasting channel capacity. Okay. So let us assume we have two users. First user is the capacity is N1. Second user capacity is N2. You can think about virtually is the first user is the pipe is wide because it's a strong user has N1. Second user pipe is narrow is N2. As a transmitter side, so that is a capacity from your deterministic channel model, okay? And uh, as a transmitter side, we are going to transmit the user one with M1 bits. That's the rate for user one. User two with M2 bits. That means we are going to map user one's M2, M1 bits into the code word U1, user two's M2 bits into code word U2. Later on, we do uh, superposition coding, okay? With the capacity region uh, principle, you can clearly say, because user one is a stronger user, your M1 plus M2 must be less than the pipe of user one's uh, capacity M1. The same thing for user two, M2 must be less than M2 because it's a weak user. So you transmit the signal going through the channel because user one is a, a strong user, M1 plus M2 is less than one, which means user one is able to receive both U1 and U2. But user two has a lower capacity. So all those bits above its capacity uh, capability will be truncated or it will be um, uh, disappearing. So at the receiver side for user two, you only see Partial of user one's message together with user two, its own message. So this is the determinant approach for the Gaussian broadcasting channel. And it has been proved this approach can be just at the most is only one bit away from the capacity gap, I mean, capacity of a Gaussian broadcasting channel, okay? Let me say this again. This deterministic approach is only one bit away from the Gaussian broadcasting channel capacity. But the question is, can we design scheme without doing successive interference cancellation or with only treating interference as noise to achieve this capacity region for the deterministic channel model? So that is what we are going to do here. So uh, let us assume we say the user one's input message is M1 bits binary bits. User two's input message is M2 bits. And uh, we, we know the channel capacity for user one is N1, channel capacity for user two is N2. We are going to define a few terms. One term is uh, at user two, we assume some of user one's message could be decodable. And some of user one's message is not decodable. That means we define R11 equal to N2 minus M2, means N2 is the capacity of user two. M2 is the rate you transmitted for user two. Obviously, N2 is larger than M2. So the difference between these two values tells us certain message from user one actually is decodable at user two, okay? That means the rest of that message, the user one's message M1, the rest of that one is not decodable at user two. With that one, we are going to do encoding matrix construction. So for user one's encoding generator matrix, because you user one's message 
is split in two parts. One part is decodable at user two, another part is not decodable at user two. So we are going to have a corresponding generate matrix for that two uh, split messages. Okay, so this generator matrix G1 is for user one. You will see, okay, we have a certain part is zero, certain part is zero. You probably don't see why we have it here, but later on, I'm going to introduce the G2, generator matrix for user two. You will see why we have that. Generator matrix for user two actually is M2. This M2 is just a M2 by M2 full rank binary matrix. So to generate a, a code word and also doing superposition coding, the size of this matrix is carefully designed in such a way. So you see this is superposition coding, user one's message, user two's message, user one's message is there, G1, U1, user two's code word is G2, U2. You can see actually this M2, the size of M2 and the size of this zero are corresponding to each other. That means when you do superposition coding, your M2, U2 appears exactly the same here. And M11, U1, a part of user one's code word is here, a part of user one's code word is here. So what we see at the receiver side is for user one, we are able to, because the dimension is less than one, M1 plus M2 is less than one. That means all of those code word can be seen and decodable by user one. That means user one is able to see everything decoder U1 and U2. But, Okay, but for user two, it can only decode this blue part, but because that only this blue part is M1, uh, sorry, this um, M2 plus uh, um, R11 is less than N2, it's a capacity. So you see, the the red part actually is uh, truncated in the noise part. So that is for the user too. So that is how we see both users can decode the blue part, but only user one can decode the blue part with the red part. So you see this is a red splitting here. And uh, later on, you can, we, we are going to show this is a capacity, uh, I mean, achievable rate under the treating interference with noise. Actually, we can prove this mutual information between X1, Y1, X2, Y2 is exactly M1 and M2. What does it mean? Means at the receiver side of user one, we, we can decode both the user one, user two's message. But user one also have a choice. We don't need to decode user two's message because that's not necessary. We don't need to do interference cancellation. It's not necessary. That means user one can also decode only its own message. This is M11 and M02. So that's the rate splitting as well for user one. So that is a very interesting. We have this capacity achieving without the successful interference cancellation. Okay. Now that is uh, the background, but how do we do the lattice partition framework? How do we design the code? So I'm going to say, we are going to translate the scheme from the deterministic model into a coding scheme for the Gaussian broadcasting channel. So uh, to do that one, we need to form a lattice partition chain. So assume we have a lattice, User one is going to transmit an M1 message. As I mentioned before, we need to form a lattice partition from a, your fine lattice lambda to two to M1 lambda, that's your coarse lattice. So the coarse lattice is to, uh, carries M1 bits. That means your 
you have this partition is two to M1. That is the first level partition. You going further, uh, we also need to carry M2 messages for user two. That means we further partition this first course lattice to the second level of course lattice. That is a two to M1 plus M2 messages, uh, 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 lambda. So that is uh, at the end of the day, we define this uh, lambda S. So that is still a lattice. In total, you carry M1 plus M2 bits for your broadcasting channel at the base station, but uh, user one is able to decode the M1 messages. That's your first level of lattice partition. User two is going to carry M2 messages. That is the second level of uh, lattice partition. So that means for each user, we are going to map the source UK to a code word VK. So the transmitter signal will be user one's code word V1 plus user two's code word V2. Because user two's code word V2 build on top of the first level of partition. So that's why we have two to the power of M1 starting as your fine lattice for user two. And we also use these introduced to try to have a zero main for your signal constellation, also have to minimize your signal uh, transmitter power. So that is a basic representation for your transmitter code word. Beta is a normalized factor. And we see this is a rate splitting at the base station side. But furthermore, we see this rate splitting for user one can be represented as a V12 and V11, but V11 also need to times two to the power of R and one. So you have another similar rate splitting here. So the transmitter code word for user one and the user two are called sub-leaders. So they preserve this lattice structure. At the end of the day, user one only need to decode its own message U1 and uh, without decoding U2 first. Okay, uh, with a limit of the time, I'm not going to show you the details here. I'm only to tell you actually, we can prove this is uh, the achievable rate has a constant gap away from the capacity. For user one, the gap is uh, this number is determined by the normalized second moment. For user two, we also have a constant gap. I'm not going to show it in detail. What I'm going to show you is we can have a different lattice as our base lattice to design the code. For example, we can have an integer lattice in that too. We can have a Eisenstein integers, which is a best two dimensional lattice. We can have a best four dimensional lattice, eight dimensional lattice, or this, uh, this optimum shaping lattice from the uh, reference six. We can find what is a constant gap for these two users. And uh, we can also generalize this constant gap to K users. Uh, again, I'm not going to show you. What I'm going to show you, visualize, is how you design the scheme, how you do decoding for two user case, okay? So assume this is our uh, first level uh, lattice partition. This is A2, this is a two dimensional lattice A2. You have this uh, fine lattice. We also have this coarse lattice. This is your, uh, this A2 over four A2. Basically you have 16 code words. You can transmit M1 equal to four bits for user one with this uh, 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 core set of leaders. So that's your first lattice partition. You can go further from this uh, coarse lattice. Remember, this is our coarse, this is a fine lattice. This is our coarse lattice, the first level of coarse lattice. This is the green part, okay? Now, with this coarse lattice, the green part, we are going to do second level of partition. That's a 4A2 partition to 8A2. That means you are able to transmit, you have four core set leaders. You have M2 equal to two, you have four code words. You are going to have this uh, uh, transmission 
rate for those two. So at the end of the day, you form this lattice partition chain. So as I mentioned, initially you have this 16 code words for user one, and later you have this four code words for user two. And effectively, you transmitting six bits. So you total have 64 code words is given by this one. Remember lattice partition, and you can you need to shape it into the fundamental Venor region of a coarse lattice. At the end of the day, that's your signal constellation you are going to transmit. That's your 64 code words. Different code words represent a different latitude partition uh, representation. And uh, with that particular design, we are able to show you, assume we have two users, uh, rate, uh, signal to noise ratio 30 or 10 dB, we use a different lattice partition, that to A2 and D4, means a two dimensional, four dimensional. We are going to show you, and uh, the up curve, that is the Gaussian capacity region. The dashed curve here, that is your auth that is the orthogonal transmission scheme with D4, four-dimensional lattice. And uh, these uh, points inside show you that we can design the lattice to achieve capacity or achieve the rate for user one, three bits, user two, two bits by using different lattices. So the red one represents a two-dimensional integer, and uh, this uh, blue one represents a two-dimensional uh, uh, Eisenstein integer lattice, uh, and the green one represents uh, this uh, four-dimensional D4 lattice. And for each pair, you also see and uh, the red one, the, the solid one representing, you don't do successful interference cancellation at the receiver. You're only doing ting, treating interference as a noise. But you also have a choice, say, if you want to do successful interference cancellation, you obviously you can improve the stronger user. Here is user one's rate, but user two's rate does not improve. But the improvement is very minor if you show it in this ticket. So that is a two user case. We can also show three users a case, but for the interest of time, I just, we can also show this, uh, how we design the code and uh, use this non-binary irregular repeat accumulated code with the 10,000 bits to for this different lattice, show user one's beta rate, so user two the beta rate, how far away from this uh, capacity band. So it is very close to the capacity. I think that is pretty much I would like to share with you. And the principle is here, and but for this scheme, we have instantaneous channel state information. And uh, obviously I also prepared, and you can do, if you don't have instantaneous channel state information, you can still apply the same principle to do uh, 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 successful, sorry, to do treating interference as a noise without a successful interference cancellation. It's more involved. I'm not going to too much details there. And, uh, uh, I just keep it here, <laughs> sorry. We can also show what is the capacity uh, uh, upbound and what is the uh, uh, normal scheme like a TDMA scheme and uh, our scheme is better than there. And uh, we can also, I mean, if you have instantaneous uh, channel state information or you don't have instantaneous channel state information and you will have outage and your error rate probability slope is very poor. Can you do better if you have a block fading channel? We say, yes, you can do better. And you just need to a little bit more trick. The trick is you need to do lattice partition. On top of that, you need to do algebraic rotation, means your signal cancellation need to be rotated. The rotation way, how you find your rotation is you need to do, you need to find the best rotation or power level such that at the end of the day, your minimum product distance is maximized. We can show what is like a lattice partition based scheme and 
find the power factor for a particular user, such that you maximize your minimum product distance, such that at the receiver side, your beta rate is much better for both users rather than single user. If you use a conventional way, you probably, one user has an outage, another user, or one user has a full diversity, another user may not have a diversity, or the other way around. With the proposed scheme, we are able to show both users can achieve full diversity and the best performance there. We also show this discrete signaling without the success interference constellation can work for Gaussian interference channel. This, you know, Gaussian interference channel is a very tough channel. And uh, particularly we know the capacity, uh, exactly capacity region is only known for some subclasses. And the conventional way to design capacity achieving scheme is you need to know which region you are going to work on, which interference region you work on. That means that scheme is the interference region dependent. And for the treating interference with noise with the integer, uh, uh, with the uh, discrete signaling, we don't need to know which region you, you need to know. We can design a scheme regardless of your interference region, means uh, this scheme can be capacity achieving for all interference regions. Uh, again, I'm not going to much details. Uh, maybe I spent a little bit of time to say uh, here. So assume we have two users. One user, first user, we want to achieve a rate of seven. Second user, we want to achieve a rate of two. But uh, first user, uh, give interference to the second user six bits. Second user give interference to first user for five bits. How are you going to design the code? We say we need to design code. User one has eight bits, user two has seven bits. But somehow, and uh, at the receiver side, you see user one have eight bits, user two has seven bits. And user one give uh, um, six uh, and base interference to user two, but even with that interference, user two as a receiver side is able to decode its own red message. And the user two gave uh, um, five bits to user one, but even with that one as a receiver side, user one is able to decode seven bits information. So you are able to achieve a seven two bits. So that is a similar scheme, similar principle, but a little bit more involved. I'm not going to talk about that. And also it uh, has a constant gap to the capacity and the independent of all the channel parameters. So I think that's pretty much. And uh, I would like to share with you just uh, basically what we say is a rate splitting scheme is very important. Uh, and if we apply it with the superposition coding for discrete signaling and the trading interference as a noise for Gaussian broadcasting channel, it has a constant gap independent of the channel parameters user numbers. The key message, the takeaway message is you can use the current practical coding modulation, your current receiver, and you just need to design different code book for your transmitter, and uh, you are able to achieve good performance. So finally, I would like to thank my colleagues and the collaborators, particularly my postdoc and the main show, and uh, my collaborator, Jerry Huang and Xin Ling and uh, Chi Liang. They are from, uh, uh, many is from uh, my university, others from uh, Taiwan. And uh, so that is uh, our publication. Thank you very much. I'm not quite sure I still have time for some uh, uh, questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jin Hong, for the uh, the very interesting talks and a very solid talk. Um, so I think there are some questions. So let's take a few uh, the questions online. Maybe there is a question from Sibo. Sibo, you want to raise your question, or do you want me? To yes, read it? I think it would be easier. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Yuan, for your great presentation. Um, I actually have two questions. So the first one is regarding the system model. Um, here we assume that our transmit signal has dimension n, and n can be arbitrary, especially greater than two. Well, 
in practical systems, we normally assume the transmit signal to be a complex signal, which means it normally has a uh, dimension two. So how do you think that we, we can obtain those uh, n greater than two in practice? Are you assuming that we can uh, transmit in different time slots or frequency band? Yeah, excellent question, Shibu. Thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, so basically you are right. Uh, in practical, we have two dimensions. We have a complex signal. So if you have, like I mentioned, we have this D4 and the E8, and uh, uh, they are four dimension or eight dimension. So your four dimension, basically your transmitter, you design your signal in four dimension, means you use this four dimensional lattice. But uh, after uh, uh, that, uh, you map your signal into two time slots. That's exactly what you are saying. <laughs> okay, I see. Um, just uh, your signal need to be your, uh, just uh, when, if I, if I could go back to this, uh, this, I mean, this is a two dimensional case, but uh, I think, uh, uh, if I go back to the equation, yeah, just uh, the dimension here, the code book size is a different dimension. So that tells you how your signal is designed. Although it's in two time slots, but these two time slots signal are not isolated. They are closely related to each other. Does that make sense to you? Yes, so effectively our cancellation could be over several time slots. Is that what yes. you mean? Yes, yes. Good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I also have a second question, which is more about uh, notation. Can you go to page 25? 25, yeah, that's the next one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, this is 26. Oh, this is 26, yeah? 25, yes. Yes, I, I, I just have, I, I just, I'm just a bit confused about the notation uh, for the lattice partition, partition chain, which yeah. is in the second line. So here you have two quotient symbols. Um, and I, I guess here by quotient symbols, we actually mean the, the quotient group, right? Because mm. uh, lattice is a group and you can have a quotient of two lattices, you have a quotient group. But what I don't understand is that you, you first have one quotient group, you, you have one lattice uh, kind of mm -hmm. divided by another lattice, which forms a lattice partition. But lattice partition itself is not a lattice. So how can you have a lattice partition divided by another lattice? What, what, what does that mean? Okay, I think, uh, sorry, I probably did not present it uh, clear. What I mean is uh, by lattice partition, like uh, first, uh, like uh, this one, fine lattice, you do first level partition. So basically after the partition, you have uh, two to M1 core sets. Yes. And each, each, I mean, this two to M1 core set, each core set has a core set leader. That core set leader represent a code word. So basically you have two to M1 code words and that code word is used to represent user one's message. Does that make sense? Yes. So maybe I use this picture to show you again. Say for example, you are right. So uh, ideally the A2 is this red um, square everywhere in this, this is the A2. And the for A2 is uh, will have this uh, 16 core sets. Each core set has a core set leader. The core set leader in the fundamental null region of this core set. For example, this is, for example, this, the middle origin, that is the core set, the middle origin and this uh, 
I am drawing it. Can you see I'm drawing it? Yes. Okay. They form a corset. This corset has a corset leader is just in the middle part, in the fundamental Voronoi region. The same thing, this each red square is a corset leader. They also have, for example, this guy should also have a corset. There's corsets like here, here, here. I assume you can imagine I'm trying to draw it. So they have another corset. And this red square only represents a corset leader. So it is in the coarse lattice fundamental variety region. So you, because you have 16 corset, you have 16 corset leaders. 16 corset leader carries four beats. So that is, a, so it, you are right. It is a, the, 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 the partition does not form a lattice. What I'm saying is after partition, these points are still belong, they are subset of the corsets. Did not, did not break the, uh, sorry, still the subset of your lattice, did not break the lattice structure. Can you appreciate that point? Yes, I can. Yeah, so that is level one. Level two is the same. So remember, this is the level one's course lattice, but level two, it will be considered this point as fine lattice. This fine lattice is going to do further lattice partition. After lattice partition, you have four corset leaders. These are those four corset leaders. These four corset leaders form, uh, uh, can carry two bits for user two. At the end of the day, you have this uh, 64 corset leaders. They still belong to the same lattice. That is what I mean. That itself is not a, a lattice, but this point belong to the same lattice. It itself right. belongs to the fine lattice. Yeah. Thank you very much, Xin Hong. Um, yeah. I think the time is over. So let's see if there is maybe one more question from anyone else. Anyone here for one last question? I have maybe one quick question is, so the scheme that you have is in the results, are those extendable to vector broadcast channels? So the multi-antenna case? Um, I think it's extendable, uh, but probably uh, uh, need to do more work there. Mm. Mm. Right. Um, because the principle is, uh, is similar, as I mentioned, it's similar. But we have not worked it out yet. Yeah. Okay. Very mm. good. Yeah, could be you know further discussions and yeah. Yeah, I mean that's 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 an issue that we've had with the the rate splitting schemes, um, where there might be some interest in getting rid of this SIC. So yeah. Um, so that's that's where things are very interesting. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jin Hong, for your um, great talk. I think um, it's, it's quite promising. And what we will do is we will upload your recording on this SIG website and on YouTube so that others can have a look at that. And uh, I invite all of you to attend our next webinar that will be held on the... 1st of November, and that's going to be Professor Vincent Wong from University of uh, British Columbia in Canada. Right, and with this, Jin Hong, thank you so much for your talk and looking forward to seeing you face to face at some point in the near future. Sure, okay, thank you again, and Bruna. Thank you everyone for your attention. Yeah, and hopefully to see you all. Thank you, thank Professor. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm. Professor Yuan. Okay, bye -bye. thank you. Bye. Mm.